Thanks for listening to the nice podcast. I am available to deliver keynote presentations and workshops for your company or for your conference. Reach out to me, davedelaneyspeaks.com or email me and we can talk. Now on with the show. Hey, it's Jason Falls of the Marketing Podcast Network. You know we're trying to bring you the greatest education opportunities out there. We've got another one for you, folks. The Creator Economy Expo, CEX 2023, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses without relying on social platforms. This year's Creator Economy Expo features 10 amazing keynote speakers and over 30 in-depth breakout sessions. Join 500-plus bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, coaches, and consultants, and free freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Don't be left out. Plan to attend this year, May 1st through the 3rd, 2023 in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now and get early bird pricing and the Marketing Podcast Network has a special offer for you. You can get $100 off using the coupon code MPN100. That's MPN100. Head over to CEX.events to register. CEX.events code MPN 100. Yeah, I I definitely think it is a wise business decision. If you are a graphic designer uh, and you are trying to experiment um, or work with these types of tools, um, don't for for now would be it would be like the the most risk averse response. Nice. 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 Nice with Dave Delaney. Welcome to the NICE podcast, all about communication, collaboration, and becoming better leaders. I am your host, Dave Delaney from futureforth.com, where we teach uh, we teach you how to retain talent and improve culture and communication so you have happier, more connected teams. Today, I'm speaking with Franklin Graves, an in-house technology and IP attorney who publishes the Creator Economy Law newsletter weekly on LinkedIn. Franklin, welcome to NICE. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and chat with you. Yeah, me too. Me too. So I always like to start these things with a question, which is, what is the nicest thing someone has done for you recently? Oh my goodness. The nicest thing someone has done for me recently. I met with a law student um, for a coffee. I meet with law students frequently just to chat about their professional career path and and life post law school because it's very hard to get out of that funnel um but i had the nicest follow-up actually uh, mailed thank you note and this particular law student also is a cartoonist uh and they actually drew me a custom cartoon on the thank you letter i still have it here in my office um i think that's that that was probably one of the nicest things that's happened to me in the last month You know, I love that. And, you know, you, we both sort of work a lot around technology and in sort of the online tech space. And, um, you know, in the consulting work that I do and in the presentations that I do, I have this nice method framework that I use. And part of that is about sending a thank you card. And it's amazing how impactful an old school analog card, uh, can be these days. So, you know, I talk about it from the perspective of a leader of an organization or a team, you know, starting the week off by writing a a thank you card and mailing it to somebody on the team. Um, But I love this example. And it just reminds me of how impactful that is. Absolutely. Especially because like you're saying, we don't really get physical mail that much anymore. Yeah. Uh, And to, to not receive just the it's still nice to get an email. Thank you. Follow up. I think any type of follow up of gratitude is absolutely welcome. But yeah. to go that extra step of taking the time, hand drawing, hand drawing something, not just writing something, yeah. and then and then passing that along, dropping it in the mailbox, kind of old school. It, it was nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good reminder for everybody to 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 do that. Tell me who is someone I do want to get talking about uh, technology and, and intellectual property and law and things like that. But I, I'm curious, as far as your career, tell me like someone who was nice to you in your career and, and you know, what, what that led to or, or, you know, kind of the story around that. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney. And so for me, it, I'm a first generation attorney in my family. Mm. So for me, I didn't have that, that, um, that family member or 
or other person in my life that was able to guide me once I got into the legal field and the legal profession. So mm-hmm. for me, um, there were actually a, a couple different leaders, but um, I'll back up just a second. I went a, a non-traditional path after law school, or I think maybe now it's less non-traditional, but I went, I didn't go the law firm route. Um, so if you are familiar with law school at all, you, you graduate from law school and you typically go work for a firm for, for a couple of years, you might stay there forever, become partner, or you might go start your own law firm. Or you might go in house somewhere and work for a corporation. There's lots of different avenues to take, but I went a non-traditional path where I didn't go through and go through a law firm environment where I had training, I had mentors. So for me, I ended up having to create kind of my own mentorship program Mm. and I found bar associations. I found um, events that I could go to around town to connect with other attorneys. And so through that, there were some key people early on in my professional career that were able to be sounding boards when I needed to run something by them or um, just to, to chat. I think having a network like that was invaluable um, and especially because I was going into, I, uh, I was in the uh, record, I worked for a record label and I was the only attorney as well. Mm. So there weren't other attorneys in that environment that I could rely on. So for me, it was more so crafting and having not just one mentor, not just one person that was pouring back into me and being nice, but many. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was through, through that, that I kind of developed my own network, kind of had that own mentorship element. And um, there were key people along the way that I still remember that were, that were nice to me, that, that invested in me. And I would say after about three or four years, it came full circle because one of those people reached out to me and asked me for my advice on a particular issue. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like I got off the phone. I just sat there for a moment. I was like, wow, like I just helped this person who had been pouring into me so much I now had the opportunity to share a little bit of my expertise that was new to them and nuanced for them. Um, and so I think that 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 was like a real wake up call for me to be like, okay, it all worked out. People were nice to me. And now it's like, I, I can always try to return the niceness and, and be kind to, to others. Yeah, definitely spread the love for sure. I love it. I love it. When we were scheduling this, this conversation, I put it out on, on the socials, uh, over on social, on Facebook, uh, in this case, uh, and ask, uh, some folks for questions for you regarding, uh, artificial intelligence. And I have, of course, my own questions, um, but give me a little bit of, uh, so I'm going to share some of those questions, but give me a little bit of the lay of the land these days as we're all, or not, we're not everybody yet, but as soon as, you know, Google, uh, includes it. <laughs> I expect everybody will be using <laughs> AI uh, search uh, among other things, you know, with the inception of chat GPT, uh, which, you know, certainly is the darling of the space. What, what are some trends? What are some things that you're seeing these days as it applies to, to AI? Yeah, I think there's so much like almost, I think it's the AI explosion, mm-hmm. if you want to call it that. Right. Um, going through uh, parts of 2022 and definitely at the end and now here at the beginning of 2023, mm. it has it has definitely become mainstream topic of choice. And I think rightfully so, because there's there's kind of this like surface level kind of discussion to be had regarding jobs, job security, how will this impact a workforce? Um, in terms of our AI, our, is AI or AI tools or bots, whatever, coming for our jobs? And that's definitely something to talk about, especially in light of the the events in terms of the tech layoffs. And then um, Microsoft, for example, their their layoffs, and then the and then almost like the turn right around and they announce the investment and in open AI, yeah. which they've been doing for years. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's one way to look at it. But I think from my perspective, I've also played around with chat GPT. I played around with some of the like uh, open AI tools like Dolly too. And, and then also mm-hmm. I've not used mid journey, which is like the um, text image that, that connects with discord to be able to do that. But I've played around with a couple of different options and, from a legal perspective, from a, from using it within a law practice environment, um, it's still a ways off. I think that there's definitely capabilities there and recognizing the limitations of the beta versions that we're all basically seeing right now. Cause yeah. it, we haven't seen 
the true, uh, for lack of a better analogy, the, the true Mercedes-Benz come out uh, of these companies that is all the bells and whistles, top tier, does can do everything. Mm. Um, so I think that from a, from a career standpoint, from a job stability standpoint, it's an unknown, but I do think that there's the approach that I'm taking with it is how can I stay on top of these capabilities and the tools experiment with them myself, which I've not done um, in connection with my actual full-time job um, Mm -hmm. because that's up to my employer (laughs) and and anyone listening should definitely work with their employer before they start implementing this stuff themselves. Um, That I, I, I'm viewing it more so as an assistant um, it is a great tool to speed up workflows, to get things done a little more efficiently, um, not as a full on replacement yet, or at least from what is publicly available. Um, and then that's just that again, that that's just one way to look at it. But we can definitely dive into the to the um, legal aspects of it as well, because there's a lot there as well. Yeah. And to that point, uh, Phil had the question who, and and this is my question too, actually, but who owns the copyright on edited, uh, but first generated by AI content. So written images, video, audio, uh, if that matters, does it like, so it's first generated on AI or by AI and then edited by, you know, whoever is editing that content. Um, who owns that, that copyright? Yeah, well, I guess first and foremost, I'm not an attorney for yes. anyone listening. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I was going to that disclaimer. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. yes, 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 everybody. Perfect. Yes. The fun, fun not, rules. Not legal, legal advice. Yeah. yeah, not legal advice. Yes, this is an educational discussion. Perfect. These are all hypothetical situations, not specific to any one person's actual issue. Um, so, yeah, living <laughs> or dead. Great, great. Living. Yeah, let's just round out. Let's do all the legalese in there. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, no, I think for real, it's, it's a valid, valid question. Um, and the, the, the way that I divide up buckets of AI, and I think the best way to examine it is uh, three different buckets. So you have the data sets, the, the pre-existing works that are being used to train an AI tool, such as like a machine learning model, all that kind of fun stuff. Then you have like the second component of it, which is the actual algorithm and the tool itself. So like OpenAI, any of their tools they offer, like ChatGPT, Dolly, whatever, um, or MidJourney or Stable Diffusion, all of that. Those are those are the bucket. That's the, those all fall within the second bucket, which are the actual tools that we use. And the third gets to the question that the the person asked in terms of, okay, what about the output? <laughs> what, what who owns that? And and so I think um, we can definitely circle back to the, the first and second buckets if you want to. But the third bucket is kind of where people are really kind of focusing on right now um, in terms of the, the user experience. Kind of, okay, wh- what happens to this that I create or generate, if that's a more appropriate term, based on the tool? Mm. And I would uh, – so from the, the way that I look at it is first you have to understand what tool you're using and what are the terms of that tool. Um, and I actually had a <laughs> had had an interesting discussion with another attorney because they had a client that came to them, and this their client um, is an art a graphic artist, uh, and they generated images for a client that are stock images to be used on their web, that their client's website for product kind of just marketing purposes, and so it's like whatever. And, and, and they had been hired to do that. They've been hired to create that. And, and the, the issue was coming up in that the graphic artist, um, mm. they were using mid journey to generate the images. And if you look closely at mid journeys terms, they have kind of two levels to them. Uh, the first level being kind of the free, um, you don't have to pay a subscription to use it. And that, the last time I looked at the terms, this could change uh, if somebody's listening, but the terms basically grant the user of MidJourney a Creative Commons license. Uh, But they do offer an enterprise subscription um, that affords more rights over the work and makes it a little more protectable if if, like your, your company or if you're a graphic designer you want to use it as a tool, you you have the right to go and subscribe, and then you get more ownership, if you want to call it that, over the works that you generate, the outputs that you generate using the tool. But circling back around, I think the main issue, though, is the terms also include a license back to MidJourney 
um, that is kind of a gap, if you want to call it that, in title. Because when you're looking at works that you're creating as an artist, you want to own it outright. Traditionally, an artist would use, even if they use Photoshop and or Illustrator to put together custom artwork for somebody, mm. they assign to that to their client, they assign them all the rights in the artwork um, or whatever they negotiate. Um, and so in this instance, this person, this graphic artist had done that. They signed an agreement, a services agreement, and they said, I'm conveying to you and assigning to you all rights and ownership to this work that you're hiring me to create. But if you look back at it, now the client, now, the, now that, that company is saying, well, you don't actually have the rights to do that because you use MidJourney. And if you look at MidJourney, it says you grant to MidJourney a, a non-exclusive, but a perpetual, irrevocable, kind of all that kind of fun legal language mm. that basically says um, MidJourney can use that output, the images that are generated, as well as the prompts that were used. So any mm. of the text-to-speech, text-to-image tools, you have to craft prompts to generate the output. They're, they're also granting a license to MidJourney for that. Um, so it basically this, <laughs> this graphic designer was stuck in a situation where they were wanting to get paid, but then their client, the company was turning around saying, well, you didn't deliver, you, you didn't, you can't grant us all the rights that are necessary. So hmm. I think that's the first, that's a really long explanation, but a good example of make sure you understand the terms of whatever service you're using, especially if it's a beta, like, um, open AI has been releasing or any of the others that are out there. I know you can go on to so many different tool offerings right now, like AppSumo is, is one where they, they're they're selling left and right all these different AI tools, but you got to be careful and read the terms and conditions of the, the service and understand what rights you are actually being given, if any, or maybe all of them. So that, that's, that's where I would start is understanding what tool are you using? What does it tell you that you as the user of the tool actually own mm-hmm. in terms of the output? Yeah, that's interesting. So what you're saying is in that case, the customer hired a graphic designer, the graphic designer used uh, AI to generate an, an image, let's say, or a logo or whatever it was. And then the graphic designer sold that to the client, but the client refused to buy it because the because of the terms and conditions from the AI side said that anybody could use this graph, this logo or whatever image was generated, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And I think mid journey is a little nuanced there because mid journey is connected to discord. Right. And within that community, there's a sense of you share what is generated. Um, and you don't have to, especially like I said, if you're on the enterprise, but it, it opens the argument to have these kind of nuanced discussions of, okay, Legally, what am I? What what am I agreeing to both with my client as a graphic designer and with the tools that I use? Right. And that even goes with Adobe. I mean, Adobe. If you use Adobe Creative Cloud um, as a creator, you have to go in and actually opt out of their privacy policy for if you use like their document cloud or if you use their cloud based services to host your images and stuff you have to go and opt out of allowing them the right to use whatever content you host with mm-hmm. them. You can opt, you have to opt out of allowing them to use that content to train and build a, an algorithm or a model, um, an AI model. Um, Cause otherwise they, they can. Huh. Um, so there are little pitfalls just all throughout the industry. And that, that's not even getting to the, the other issue. Now we're seeing with the copyright office, the U S copyright office at least is denying registrations or, in the case of uh, Chris Chris uh, Kashanova, their registration for a graphic novel that they they wrote, but they used AI Midjourney to generate the images for, they they were given a copyright registration for it back in October. But then in November, the copyright office was like, "Oh, <laughs> we made a mistake. We have to look at this. You have to tell us more about your process and what yeah. ownership are you actually claiming." And so, even from a protection standpoint, like as a copyright owner. Um, or as a as an artist or a creator that's using these tools, you want to be able to claim ownership and be able to protect your output uh, from the tools. But right now, it's very unclear as to whether the copyright office will allow you to register it. And then, if you're not familiar with copyright, to, <laughs> part of that is you need to register it with the copyright office because then you can get like the fun stuff, like attorney's fees <laughs> awarded to you if somebody's infringing, and you can go after them for statutory damages, mm. um, as a, and and all that kind of fun stuff that that protects creators in that sense. And you made, you mentioned something earlier too, that I, w- I wanted to mention, which is and now I've, I've, I've been on online since the forever. And so as an early adopter of a lot of, you know, social media and, and content platforms, 
you know, web blogging, let's say back in, you know, 2002, I think it was. And, and podcasting too, you know, like I started podcasting in 2005. So creative commons has always been something near and dear to many of a, a creator's heart, especially from the kind of web 2.0 uh, timeline where, um, but even with creative commons license things, there are different levels of creative commons licenses. So, you know, some where you can have at it and hack it up and do whatever you want with it. Others who you can use it, but non-commercially, uh, and things like that. So even in, in the case of creative commons, for example, if an AI, uh, platform, offered a creative commons license to the material, you'd have to still confirm what level of creative commons, what specific creative commons license, right? Exactly. Um, and I, I think that is search engine optimization can be confusing, but your business can benefit from it regardless of what you do. SEMrush, an all-in-one digital marketing suite, can cover key SEO activities, including tracking your competitors' keyword strategies, improving search rankings, and much more. Why choose multiple solutions when you can use just one? Start your free trial today and get on top. Go to bit.ly slash SEMrushMPN. That's B-I-T dot L-Y bit.ly slash SEMrushMPN. That's a really good point about Creative Commons. And, and part of it is there are many different flavors of the license that yeah. are available. Um, some grant commercial um, use of the work. Uh, some, some do not. Uh, but I think with mid journey, it was a, um, it was a non-commercial 4.0 attribution international license. And so what that means is, well, first of all, it's good that it's 4.0 is basically the, just the newest version of the creative commons license. Right. Um, there have been previous versions and over time, just due to different nuances of how, uh, the license terms have been either used or in the case of that transition from 3.0 to 4.0, um, misused because the the 4.0 transition afforded a greater um, lax uh, ability if you don't properly um, give credit or attribution mm -hmm. to the the creator or the person releasing the content under the Creative Commons license. It takes away it gives you the opportunity to fix that to a degree. But um, so that that's that the non commercial aspect though is is the key here because if you're using Mid Journey and you're not paying for their corporate membership or their paid membership plan, you really are not getting much of any ownership really and rights to use the outputs. And, and so that that could be a huge issue for creators or businesses that rely on on a uh, mid journey, for example, or other, other creative commons types licenses. So I almost feel like, and getting back to your original kind of case story or case study or story there, I almost feel like it's on the businesses themselves who are going to hire a graphic designer, let's say in this example, in the agreement or, or contract that you have with that graphic designer to stipulate, you know, and, and I would, I would argue in the case of a graphic designer, they probably shouldn't be using AI anyway, maybe for inspiration, but, but that's about it because they're a graphic designer. So maybe it should be part of that contract not to use AI so that if things go south, uh, so to speak for the client, then they can, you know, talk to the, and then they can release the hound smithers to the graphic designer. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely think it is a wise business decision. If you are a graphic designer uh, and you are trying to experiment um, or work with these types of tools, um, don't for for now would be yeah. <laughs> would be like the the most risk averse response. Mm. Um, but at the same time. There are instances like um, Adobe, not I, I keep uh, this is like the second time I've mentioned them. I'm not trying to put them on blast, but yeah. Adobe um, just they have a subset uh, a, a, a platform called Adobe Stock where you can go and license stock images mm. um, as well as other assets. But um, the images in particular, they just announced I think a month or two ago they would open up and allow submission of generative art for licensing through Adobe stock for images. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very clearly disclosed as such. I think it's a good example. So if, if you are listening and you are a graphic designer, somebody in a creative industry, I think Adobe sets forth some really good community guidelines and kind of use guidelines and artist guidelines for when you're working with generative art. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think it's still, from my perspective, it's still a very unsettled 
area of law yeah. um, from a copyright standpoint, from an infringement copyright infringement standpoint, but then also um, going back to uh, Chris, Chris, Christina Kashtanova's example of her, uh, sort of their graphic novel, the, they were very clear and transparent about their process on their Instagram account where they would go through and document in detail. Okay, here's how I created, these are the prompts that I used to create this particular image output. Um, so where I'm going with this is like, in their examples, they would actually use by name Zendaya, um, who's a, who's an actor, uh, singer, all that, um, Zendaya, they would, they would use Zendaya as a name to generate as part of the prompt to generate output images that are very similar likeness to mm-hmm. Zendaya. And so if you're doing things like that, you also have to be mindful of not only the underlying copyright of whatever images were used of Zendaya, to train the model to understand, okay, this is Zendaya, this is what she looks like. Um, But also the, the name image likeness rights that are associated with that, the the right to publicity, the rights of privacy, they they all go, they're bundled all together. And, and most people are now familiar (laughs) with them because of sports um, and specifically college athletics. Um, So NIL, Oh, that that has been around for much longer <laughs> than yeah. just sports. Um, there's the recent uptick, but they are state level rights that, you, that vary from state to state, and can be another pitfall when working with this because your outputted image could be very similar to either the likeness of somebody, or it could be very similar to an existing image, and that's where you could potentially be held liable for copyright infringement as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of clearance work that have that would have to be involved, but I think. Going back to that other example I gave of like the client, um, the graphic designer client who had issue with their client for using AI, I, I think it's also is it like you were you you made a great point? Is it clearly disclosed in the contract that an AI tool will be used? I think that's the best best way to go about it. So, if you have your contract or if you're doing like a new SOW or something like that to go along with the contract, making it clear up front, you understand that there's risk involved with my use as an artist or creative, my use of an AI tool, Uh, whether it's an image-based output or whether it is um, text-based, like using chat GPT or using a writing assistant that will help write copy for somebody, things like that, like that could, it's harder to to pinpoint infringement in those instances, but there are, there are times when text output could theoretically be very extremely similar to something that was trained on. Um, so, so there's, there's a wide gamut here and it kind of does depend on the medium um, of the output image versus video versus text versus audio, whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. I think, uh, it would be, it would be wise and almost a selling feature to that perhaps we'll start seeing more of as, as you know, litigation begins in, 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 and kind of horror stories in AI create in the AI creative space that, that more and more designers or writers or whomever will, you know, include a feature in, in their, their sales pitch that includes no AI generated content, uh, you know, just for, <laughs> for, for the client horror yeah. stories that you hear of, you know, certainly as, as, those stories uh, come to light and become more commonplace. I think people will, will start looking, uh, you know, for that as a feature. Chris wrote and asked me a question. If you use an AI to generate a contract, can you sue the AI's owners if that contract fails to perform? That is a great question. Another area here, um, it kind of is a mix of product liability, mm. um, product liability law, because if you think about it, if you produce a widget and you put it out there, um, you are potentially liable if it causes harm to somebody. Sure. That's just like a, a basic understanding. You want to, as a manufacturer, as a seller of a product or even a service, you stand behind what you're putting out there and you could be held liable legally um, all of that. So that, that, that I would say is a very settled area of law. I say mm-hmm. that hesitantly because I'm sure that's not an area of law that I practice in all the time. I'm sure that there are people out there that would probably argue with me on that and be like, no, this is not settled. It's very unclear. But I think generally that's just one element to consider is what, what is, what is the industry that it's within and what are the regulations that apply right. um, historically, how have uh, manufacturers or producers or sellers or resellers been, held liable um, for 
harm that's caused as a result of something. So I, I think that's that's one element of it is the regulatory component. So you have the products liability, um, just general kind of principles of being held responsible for what you're putting out there hmm. um, and selling or reselling or whatever. Then the other element there is, okay, are you operating within a heavily regulated industry? So if it's if it's medical or healthcare, then you have to think about all the regulations that come along with that. And that even includes uh, like the FDA or even the FTC now is getting involved in, in data privacy and healthcare. Um, but then there, there are so many areas and nuances of regulations that, that could come into play that you have to think about. Um, so yeah, and, and I honestly, I think a great example here is Tesla um, looking at their autopilot feature, which is AI based and kind of constantly learning and, mm-hmm. and understanding the environments around the cars. Um, so we are starting to see that, but from a legal standpoint, um, there was recently in the news about AI in the courtroom and having, um, wearing like an AirPod and having a, an AI basically listen in as a judge or opposing counsel is speaking and then tells you what to say, um, as either a, a defendant that is defending themselves without representation or whatever. And so, from that, the issue then becomes the unauthorized practice of law. So there are industry-specific issues that come about. So I think a long-winded way of saying an answer to the question is yes. I think that there is potential for liability to be um, carried back onto the the company that has released the tool or the service provider for the tool. Mm. Um, but again, the amount of liability, the extent to which that can be disclaimed or whatever right. is again, dependent on those relationships, the contractual relationship between the user of the tool. And I, I also would imagine the AI platform, let's say chat GPT probably I expect has a terms of service itself so that if you're going to use it, it probably in that terms of service, you know, excludes trying to sue them if your contract that you automatically generate fails. Um, I would imagine it's probably in there, right? In the fine print when you use it ahead of time. Um, right. And, yeah. And, and yeah, so specifically when you're looking at, at the, you have two kind of, whenever you uh, baseline, whenever you sign up for a service online or mm. buy a product online or whatever, you're agreeing to the terms of service. Sometimes yeah. it's called the terms of use. Um, That is where you would find, like you were talking about, those disclaimers, uh, both um, warranty, so disclaiming that you are going to be able to use the product exactly how you need it to function, that it will always be up and available for you. Um, And then you also have like the limitations of liability, which is basically saying that you agree that either the company has no liability or depending on state laws and what courts have said, it's capped at a reasonable amount, which is sometimes service fees that you've paid. Um, and then the other is indemnification. So if you, um, like if you're using chat GPT and the output is infringing on somebody else's work and you get a lawsuit over it, um, is chat GPT going to come in and defend you for it? And and I think getting away from open AI, I've been using them as a lot as an example. Another example there is, um, Microsoft who, which owns GitHub. Um, and so GitHub has autopilot is a tool they released, um, last year. It's now part of a class action lawsuit that they responded to as well. Um, but essentially if you're using a tool like copilot to draft your code and to not draft, sorry, I'm using legal to, to write your code for, yeah. um, as a developer, if you're writing whatever code you're writing, um, if it's auto completing or writing entire sections for you, what is your liability? If that is infringing on whether it was a piece of open source software that that AI was trained on and it ends up infringing on that or, or something else, um, all of that is going to be determined by the terms of service or the terms of use. Uh, and then also the other element there is the privacy policy. That's the, to round up the, what I was saying. There, the second thing that you agree to typically when you register or sign up for a product is the privacy policy, which governs, like sometimes it'll say you won't put information in. Like if, if you work for a company and you start working with it to help you draft emails, then mm-hmm. you're sharing information about your clients. You're sharing information that it's able to pick up and gather from how you're using it in an environment like that, where something might not be publicly available, like your email or your Google drive. And so you got to think about, okay, the privacy policy, I'm giving them access to data that I typically would only have access to, or me and Google would only have access to. 
Um, so what does that mean? And that's where the privacy policy comes into place as well. well and, and then I, a whole other slew of things. Yeah. And I think it's a whole pain point and a problem taking a step back from all of this stuff that, you know, with, with the use of, I, I straight away, I think of social networks, for example, but you know, you opt, you opt in when you create your account to the terms of service, uh, with all of these, uh, services. And so, and, and, you know, it comes up from time to time, but like nobody ever reads them. Right. Um, unless you're maybe a lawyer, but <laughs> for most people, they, <laughs> but even then, I, and I even then, the maybe not. You, you, it's impossible. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there was an art exhibit. Was, was it an art exhibit that like had it printed out for each of that? I think just the social network, social media yeah. platforms, and it actually had it printed out and like up on the wall, and then like one of them, I don't want to call it one, but one of them went all the way down to the floor, and then out into <laughs> where where. Um, uh, people would go and, and walk on the floors. So yeah, it's like, you can't read them. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. But it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause you're not really protecting yourself as a user. If you're not at least reviewing those terms of service, but at the same time, you actually have to understand, be able to, to decipher what, what it even says in the first place. So even if you dare to go through that document, I remember once hearing about, and then I looked at it and sure enough, it was there where I believe it was iTunes uh, or I guess Apple Music now, like part of their terms of service is that the, that the, that it won't be that platform or that service won't be used for war or to start a nuclear war or something to that effect. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, some of the music maybe, but uh, yeah, that was a weird one. Um, uh, Josh asks, how do I stop AI from plagiarizing or quote unquote repurposing my copyrighted content? Ooh, that's that's a good one, um, and that is definitely a concern, uh, both for just creators around the world, <laughs> as yeah. as well as uh, media companies and um, yeah, I think <laughs> media companies and entertainment companies that that survive off of their IP. Um, I, I think that it is it is very open right now in terms of there are actually lawsuits happening. One of the most recent ones filed actually in the last couple of days was Getty Images uh, filed a lawsuit in Delaware here in the United States um, against um, a couple of different AI companies. And so in that sense, we will start getting answers in terms of what liability is there on these particular uh, tech companies that are putting and that are they're basically crawling the web, scraping the web um, to build their AI tools and to build these massive, whether you want to call them data sets of images or whether you want to call it just um, massive amounts of training images. I think those training images was the word used in one of the lawsuits. Because um, and the reason why I make that distinction is I think it's it's very down down off putting and kind of um, downplaying the significance of a let's just take the the images ones because they're the easiest it, it downplays the value of an image of an artist whether it is a photograph that they're painting or whether it was actually a photographer or whatever or a digital mm-hmm. artist it downplays their their rights it downplays their ownership over the work that they've crafted, they've spent years crafting it, downplays all of that by calling it, oh, it's just data. We're scraping and we're making a copy of that work just for the limited purpose of training an AI algorithm. Um, and so like in Stable, Stable Diffusion's example, um, it used a database based out of Germany that was put together for research purposes, which in the UK, they have a they have what's called the text and data mining exception, hmm. uh, which allows for web scraping and the the use of, of copyrighted works um, for training a data set uh, and building a data set for an AI tool, but only within the context of educational or research purposes, not for a commercial purpose, which is what we're seeing now in, re- in flooding the market. Hmm. Um, so, so basically, what happened is the 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 tool was was generated by making copies of these pre-existing works, these people's artwork and transforming it, I think is the right term. And I think that's also supportive of, of the arguments being made on the other side is it's transformative, which would then in the U S trigger an exception to copyright law under fair use as one of multiple factors. Uh, one of four factors actually that are considered for fair use defense to copyright infringement in the U S. So 
all that to be said, um, whether or not it's actually appropriate still from a legal standpoint is unclear. It's unsettled. We have litigation going on about whether or not you can copy pre-existing works or scrape that information from the web and use it without permission or a license to train an algorithm that will then either compete with or do similar functionality to whatever data was scraped. So that that's just one way to look at it and one one issue that we're seeing now. Um, but but going back to that question of is there anything you can do? There are tools coming out now. I think the cat's out of the bag. It's probably the, the best way to describe it. You can't go and take down all your works and have these companies destroy their algorithms. That's that's not happening yet. Um, I think that um, it's really difficult. So in reality, I think it, it's it's there's there's not really much to do because once you put something on the internet you, you can't really take it back um mm. it's like the right click um whatever you want to call it maybe that maybe that's a um theory right click theory or something but yeah. anybody can copy and, and take anything um and you can't really stop them from doing that but what you can do is pursue them for the activity they're choosing to do um so yeah but going back to the the training set out of germany was billions of images and it's like how is I think the lawsuit we're seeing now from Getty Images is um, they were able to generate outputs that still had like the Getty Images watermark on them. Mm. Um, and and so it's like very clear that the algorithm uh, was trained and the model was trained using images from at least Getty Images because it has that Getty Image watermark on it that, right. that you see often when somebody shares something with, without a license. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think it's still an an, um, an untested area. There are licenses out there that you can, um, and I'll, I'll uh, maybe we can put them in the show notes or something. But there are example licenses out there. So if you are an artist that wants to work with um, what I would I would I think most people are calling morally or ethically um, built AI tools, you can license your works and get a fee in return, mm. um, for contributing your works. Um, but the legal side of it away from the moral and ethical issues, the legal sides on, on, we don't know yet, but from a moral and ethical perspective, I think it's pretty clear. A lot of people are, are fighting and saying it's, it's wrong to be doing this. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it's just the reality of there are opportunities to, contribute your works if you want to, but as an artist, if you don't, that is your right. And yeah. how you exercise that right or pursue people that didn't respect your right um, is still an unknown. Huh. Interesting. So let's picture that I'm an artist or a writer or something, and I'm about to, you know, and I've just taken a photograph, like, and I'm putting it online on my website, on my portfolio to, to share. Uh, or, and it may not be a photo, whatever it is. What are you, what are some some steps that you would take? Let's say you you uh, Franklin. Let's say you're the photographer. What would steps would you take in order to protect uh, your works, uh, both from AI uh, uh, plagiarizing or, or 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 stealing, if you will, or or even from other people doing the same? Like, what are some steps that you would take to protect your IP? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So for me, a couple different things. First, from a uh, maybe post-production standpoint, if you want to call it that, before I release <laughs> um, a, a photograph, I would ensure that the metadata is complete and has a copyright notice included, which I think most programs or software now, especially from Adobe, if you're using Lightroom or something like that, um, or whatever, um, you have the option to include and embed um what's called CMI or copyright management information. Mm. Um, and so that is actually a statutorily in the U S that's a statutory right that, that you have to, to not have somebody strip that out and remove that because it makes it harder than for, for me as a photographer to go and, and understand, okay, this is my image or whatever. Um, or communicate to others that this is a copyrighted image from the metadata. So that, that's one element. I think that's one of the arguments that we're seeing a lot in some of these lawsuits that are happening, whether it's the class actions or whether it's Getty's um, most recent one as well. You're seeing the arguments made that, and it's actually, it's actually it falls under the DMCA, which most people are familiar with, um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, in terms of, oh, 
uh, somebody posted my photo on Twitter or somebody put my image on their website or it's on YouTube, I'm going to submit a takedown request. Um, that's typically where people, you have to copyright um, takedown notice, notice and takedown provisions are within the DMCA, which most people are familiar with. But there's also other elements. There are many other elements to the DMCA. And one of those is the obligation for anyone that is operating an online service to respect and not strip away copyright management information. So that would be the first step is I would make sure that that information, that metadata is getting embedded and carried out along with the whatever file or version of the image that I'm going to release. Mm. And then the second thing is there, I'd be very selective about the platforms I'm choosing. Um, DeviantArt is one example. Um, when I was in middle school and high school, I had a DeviantArt account. And it's like, um, I think it's, it's one of those situations where you agree to their terms um, you agree to put uh, you, in exchange for a free portfolio that you're essentially being able to get for that site. And the same thing with Flickr. If you're back in the day when um, before, I think it was it was um, standalone, then Yahoo bought them and then it swiveled out of, under Yahoo, I think. And now it's, who knows, I don't know the ownership path anymore. But mm-hmm. Flickr is a good example of um, if you're putting something out there, Flickr actually allows you to, um, more nuanced and a more nuanced way associate um, with your image when it's displayed on the platform, the copyright information. So you can yeah. either say all rights reserved, which means that you as the owner, nobody else can use it. Or like we were talking about earlier, you can assign a creative commons license to it. Um, right. And one of the things that most people don't know about YouTube. So let's move out of the photography example, YouTube, actually, when you upload a video, you have the option to select two different license types to apply to your video. Mm. Um, so if you have a YouTube studio account, you upload your video, when you're putting in the, the title, uploading your thumbnail, there is one op- one section where you can select either the standard license, that's the standard YouTube license, which means it's a limited license. You retain ownership of it. Nobody else can use it except for as is detailed in the YouTube's terms of service, which we can talk about if you want to. There's mm-hmm. some nuances there that are yeah. kind of fun. Um, or you can apply a Creative Commons license, an attribution license, that yeah. which allows anyone to reuse your works um, off of YouTube or in, a, in the way that Creative Commons allows. So that's the second point is I would look and be very selective on the the platforms that I'm choosing to release my photographs through, or in the case of clients, I'm allowing them to release through. Mm. What's the, what's the nuanced stuff with uh, YouTube? <laughs> I, I'm a big YouTube fan. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoy talking about it. It's that. only that's the, why, it's only the, started the, Oh, sorry. I was going to say it's only the second largest search engine in the world. So uh, yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, that no, 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 TikTok's giving them some added pressure for for search, but yes, yeah. um, I think that I, I think that um, I, I love working with creators. I love the creator economy. That's why I started the Creator Economy Law podcast. I sorry, the newsletter, Creator mm-hmm. Economy Law newsletter, um, is because it's nuances like this. So if you look at the the YouTube terms of service, you're it's the typical terms of service where you as the creator um, and YouTube actually calls. Um, people that upload content to their platform creators um, you as a creator on their platform are granting YouTube, the license, a, a license necessary for them to operate the service. So you're granting the license to distribute, publicize, copy, make derivative works of whatever of your video when you upload that, because that's obviously necessary for them to run the service. They have to copy it from server to server. They have to do whatever, all that kind of fun stuff. They have to be able to embed it uh, or allow others to embed it with the YouTube tool. But there's also this other element there um, where you're also granting other users a license to use your video. And so that's where it gets a little more nuanced. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Um, and you have to kind of, I've, I've had a, a lot of fun diving in and kind of thinking through all the nuances, nuances of this, but YouTube as a individual user, you and I sign up for it, or we just go to the platform without signing up. We can only use it for a non-commercial um, personal reason. Uh, that's the only way that we're allowed to watch videos and we can only watch a video as YouTube allows us to. So we can't download the video using a stream ripper or a YouTube download site, or, um, if we're watching on our phone, we're not supposed to use the, the screen recording option or whatever that might be. Um, we are only as a user permitted by YouTube to watch the video using YouTube's player. Um, and so that I think is, okay, that's cool. So that really means if, if I, as a 
creator, going back to that term, I, those terms I said, where I, when I upload my video, I'm allowing other people that are using the YouTube service the right to um, use my video, a license to use it in some way. It's limited for people that are just going there to watch videos. But now, if I'm a creator on YouTube and I want to remix or use somebody else's video, it's un- it's unclear as to whether you're granting them a license to do that. Mm. Um, and if so, how is it limited? And I think we're seeing this now even more so with um, YouTube allows, they now have YouTube shorts. And yeah. if you go on the website, um, you load up your phone, you have the option or some videos to remix it if you have like an account. And right. so you can you can build on top of it. it's very common TikTok. It's kind of a remix culture um, is, is a good term for it yeah. um, where, where you can take content that people have uploaded and remix it and build upon it or whatever, provide commentary. Um, so I think that's one element there of where that's one example of the license being used in that way. But it's unclear because if I, if like, I know I, there, there was a lawsuit back, I think 2017 or 2018 where um, YouTubers love to upload videos commenting on another YouTuber's video. And so they'll take clips of that video and edit it in and add commentary. And that would be arguably a fair use. But the the remaining question, though, is, well, how did you get a copy of that video to do that? Right. If YouTube's licensed terms only allow you to access the service to watch it, and you're not supposed to be able to use downloader sites or whatever, and YouTube doesn't have any functionality, um, to allow you to download the download the video and, and splice it up and edit it aside from hitting that remix button. What, how are you getting access? How are you getting a copy of that? So it's kind of fun to walk through with creators about those types of nuances of, okay, you're actually violating YouTube's terms or you clearly have violated YouTube's terms um, to create your video, but are they going to pursue you for it? Most likely not. Yeah. Um, but then also the other talking point there is I would also toggle off that ability to remix a video, which again, like I was saying earlier, as a creator on the platform, when you upload your video, you can choose to grant a creative commons license or not. You can also choose to allow your video to be remixed. So like I watch CBS Sunday morning and I watch some of their clips on YouTube sometimes and you, they actually at CBS Paramount, they, they don't allow remixes of their videos because as a traditional media company, they're probably a little more, Mm. Um, hesitant to just let anybody take their content and remix and build on top of it um, yeah. for valid reasons. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Did you ever see there's a great documentary I watched uh, years ago called Rip, a remix manifesto? Does it ring? Yes. A- yeah. a, One of my a- favorite clips from that is when they take, they, they actually take the laptop into Mary Beth Peters, the former register of copyrights for the U S copyright office. Yeah, yeah, and they show her how the remixing is done. Yeah. And, she, and it was like so many like snippets of clips from sound recordings yeah. that make up that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's a great documentary. It's a fascinating movie for anyone listening to. I'll include a link in the show notes as well. Um, there's a, an artist kind of a club uh, DJ dance club type f- fella. <laughs> Bella. <laughs> I'm so dating myself right now where I can't actually say like DJ or I can't like properly say that. Uh, anyway, uh, he's called girl talk and he remixes, uh, he makes songs out of like a whole bunch of samples from other music. Um, which is actually, I found quite entertaining uh when I first discovered it. Cause I was in a van with like six other people for hours and we all had different genres of music that we enjoyed and and this guy actually creates music with samples so if it's like a club dance song and that's your jam but like includes like samples of like i don't know neil young which is more my jam uh within the music it's kind of like oh that's cool like neil's there or like you know old beastie boys (laughs) you know the beatles popping up and zeppelin and stuff um yeah so that's that's a neat that's a neat movie. Um, there's a, there's a author named Austin Cleon who wrote a book called steel, like an artist, um, which I'm a big fan of as well. Mm. And, and the, really the idea of, uh, inc- I mean, <laughs> kind of goes against what you do in a sense or not what you do, but like in, 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 in trademarks and copyright, but the idea of, of ripping old, content and creating new content from it not like plagiarizing but you know you look at like three card three chord blues 
music and how that really gave birth to rock and roll. I, I programmed my kids when they were little to always repeat after me, blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll <laughs> to always give credit where credit was due, <laughs> which is blues. Um, anyway, we are running rapidly out of time and this has been fascinating. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you for your time. I do have the lightning round. So I'm going to go through this very quickly with you. Complete this sentence. Nice guys and gals finish. <laughs> My mind goes to last, but I want to say first, just out of <laughs> hey, <see> what, whatever <laughs> comes to the mind, positivity. <laughs> what's a what's a nice book that you recommend uh, folks uh, listening check out? Could be anything. Um, there are some great books on AI that I recently ran through, and I'll I'll send you those so you can include them in the show notes. Mm. Um, but there is a great book by Brad Smith, who is an executive with Microsoft. Um, mm. I will specifically plug that one. It's called Tools and Weapons. It came out a couple of years ago, but then it was, um, I think within the last year or two, there was an update to it. Um, I listened to the audiobook version of it, and it is just, it's fantastic to get both the historical aspect of tech and where tech has come and gone, as well as um, politically, everything. I think it's just a really great, and it even touches on AI. Okay. Um, so that is Tools and Weapons by Brad Smith. How is Franklin nice to himself? Oh man, I just started getting into Apple Fitness Plus. Um, uh-huh. it's, a, it's a subscription with Apple. If you have Apple Fitness Plus, you can go in and do mindfulness exercises. Yeah. Um, I have really been enjoying those um, just to take a moment, stop what I'm doing, typically at night for bed or whatever. Um, it's, it's a great way to spend. You can choose. <laughs> they have them as short as five minutes, um, but you can do five, 10 or more minutes of just mindfully calming down and, and for me closing out my day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm a big, a big believer and and practitioner of, of mindfulness and and meditation. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't used that, but, uh, it's definitely uh, an interesting, uh, interesting way to do it for sure. Okay. Last thing, if Franklin had a billboard, what would it say? Subscribe to the creator economy law newsletter on LinkedIn. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, I, my, it I just started it <laughs> i started it back in october oh, um, yeah. and my, my goal was like i'd be like oh my gosh if i hit like three or five hundred subscribers within like the first year i will love it and i'm already i'm almost up to 1200 nice. um just like three or four months in and i've been so overwhelmed and happy about the feedback on it um and yeah so i would definitely put that on a billboard now that my confidence has grown in it and <laughs> I'm finding my groove with it. So yeah, (laughs) that's great. Yeah. And I'll include uh, links to everything we talked about today in the show notes. So uh, folks can subscribe to that. All right, Franklin. Well, thank you so much for your time and your insights. This has been a a fascinating conversation, probably not our last, uh, you know, we're feels like we're just getting started with this whole AI thing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the chance to come and talk and for people listening. um, It's been a great discussion. I look forward to, unpacking even more as all this continues to develop. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show today. Would you do me a favor? Leave a review. The reviews help others discover the show and they mean a lot to me. So I would appreciate that. Did you know I am often hired as a keynote speaker for company retreats or for conferences? To find out more about that, you can visit davedelaneyspeaks.com. Music by Alistair Crystal at alistaircrystal.ca. We'll see you next time. And be nice. So many times I fail to come it up. But when you look at me, melt all suspicion, destroy every red for a feeling, been appealing to believe it can't be true. But I'm so mindless and so alive. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business too? Caroline Kay hosts a great podcast called Snippets of Genius. 
Caroline, tell us what these folks will get out of listening. Snippets of Genius is a lighthearted business podcast with some brilliant insights into how you can attract and cultivate success. In each episode, I have an inspiring conversation with genius guests from the worlds of business development, marketing, design, and wellness. Each of them share their ballsy, daring moves to burst business opportunities wide open. Every episode is designed to give you as much value as possible so you can decide, define, and develop anything you want in your career or business. Hard to turn that down. Where can people subscribe? They can come on over to my website, which is www.carolineK.co forward slash podcast, or find the show at marketingpodcast.net or search for Snippets of Genius wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe.